Greetings, everyone. My name is Peter Diager, and we're going to take our departure from our normal webinar series. Usually, each month, Mark Mullally of Interthink Consulting and I put together an eclectic presentation on something related to project management of some sort. We've talked about all types of things. Today, I'm going to go back to basically my roots, and the title is deliberately chosen, as is the image, by the way. I was labeled as the Y2K doomsayer, prophet of doom, fear monger, etc., etc., etc. So I figure, why not use a nice ominous picture to depict that? And it's an autobiography because it consumed at least a decade of my life, if we don't count the time afterwards. Okay. Why did I choose today, of all days, to, <laughs> to launch this? After all, it is April 1st, Fool's Day. What do I choose today? Well, primarily because Y2K, for many people, was a joke. They considered the whole thing absurd. And the beauty of it is I happen to agree with them. Y2K was an absurdity. It was unexpected. No one expected that to happen. Now, why am I revisiting Y2K? Well, it dawned on me a little while ago that if you had been born when I published my first article on this subject, you're 26 years old, which is stunning to me, which means that the only thing you know about Y2K, you've learned from the media. And all the jokes about Y2K, where were you, December 1999, and nothing happened. So that's, that's your perspective of it. If you were born when I identified the problem, you're now 40 years old, which, which scares me because I was 25 at the time. So, Part of this is me deciding to take back the narrative on Y2K. I gave more than 2,000 media interviews on this subject starting in 1993 through to about the end of the year 2000. More than 2,000 media interviews. Now, how do I know that? Because we had a spreadsheet, and we had a line for every single interview, who it was, organization, when they're going to call, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We had more than 2,000 entries in that database. I know we didn't have 2,100, otherwise I would have upped the number. So it was somewhere between 2,000 and 2,100. I was part of this right from the start. And it's a fascinating story. It is far, far more than the story you'll typically hear about Y2K. What you'll hear is, it was all hyped. It was a scam. Nothing happened. And the reality is that's not the way it was. Okay, Not by a long shot. So I'm taking back the narrative, and we're going to do it by, well, first out figuring how to start this thing. I've been wrestling with this now for several weeks. How do I start this story? Because some of you didn't even know that I was involved in Y2K. Fair enough. You've been listening to me for more than a decade on this webinar series, but you've never known that I had a role to play in this, this thing. Some of you don't even know what Y2K is. So we sort of have to pick a starting point, none of which is correct. And I called it the Y2K an autobiography because it is my autobiography for a large part of my life. It's also a story about Y2K, and my goal is to sort of give a historical context of what this whole thing was about, from soup to nuts, you know, the, the whole thing, from when we identified, when we created the problem, to when we essentially fixed it, sort of, and there's air quotes all over that, because it's still around. We still are dealing with some of the issues. So... Who am I? Well, even before the who am I, I want to make a promise. There is an observation made by many that we are all heroes in our own story. And that's absolutely true. I am my own hero in the Y2K story. You are the own hero in your life. Those are givens. And I need to be very, very conscious of that, to give it as an objective uh, perspective of this that I can given who I am and what role I played in all of this. By the same token, though, all of the other players in this are heroes in their story. The survivalist who buries buses in his backyard, uh, 20 or 30 buses, so that they have a shelter to protect themselves from the coming apocalypse. They're the hero in their story. They were doing it because they thought it was the right thing to do. 
the media who played an incredibly large role in all of this, they were the heroes in their story. And I want to be as fair as possible to everybody involved. So I don't think you'll hear me too much talking down on anyone. And in fact, what I want to do is raise up a whole bunch of the voices that have never been heard, people who are in the trenches. Well, I want to be doing interviews in this webinar series. The webinar series is scheduled, the podcast series rather, is scheduled to start January the 1st, 2020. Why so far out, Peter? Well, because I have 24 large boxes of materials to sift through to figure out which stories I'm going to tell. Which of the many stories out there are going to make it into this podcast? And that is going to take some time, time to say the least. This image was created by an artist friend of mine, and uh, it's based upon a piece by Gerrit Du, a Dutch painter. And if you look on the internet and look for a scholar sharpening his quill, and it's part of a meme that's been used on the internet, and the meme is interesting. It sort of says, when someone says something on the internet and you happen to be an expert in it, and you get ready to respond. And I've always liked the image. So I contacted a an artist friend of mine, a person by the name of Kevin Davies. That's his website. And told him the image I liked and that I didn't want to use the original artwork for copyright reasons and all that good, all that good stuff. And I said, could you do anything? And he went ahead and he did this. And this is delightful. Um, I, I love the image, and he has pretty much captured me in more a dour mood. And I'm looking forward to um, this podcast series greatly. Uh, and I'm feeling very re released right now, to be honest. I get to tell the story. I don't have to do it through the media anymore. Okay. First thing we got to do is, what in the world is the Y2K problem? Now, there are many discussions we're going to have, and we're going to have an entire section of the podcast devoted to this. All I'm going to do today is step through the different installments of the podcast as best I can figure out what they're going to be right now because it's still early in the game. I'm still developing this thing. There is going to be at least one hour devoted to what exactly was this problem? How did it occur? How would it make itself known? And it's really easy to explain. Y2K is one of the simplest things in the world to explain. We use two-digit years to store most years in our computer systems. Now, you see that all over the place. Even after the year 2000, if you look at most receipts, most forms that you fill out on the Internet, you're going to see two-digit years still being used. Now, back in the day, we used two-digit years for good reason. We didn't have much memory. And we certainly didn't have a lot to waste typing in 19 all the time, so we left it off. So 1955, my birth date, is stored in the computer, most computers, back then, as 55. 1996 is stored as 96. 97, 98, 99, and the year 2000 would have been stored as 00. Fair enough, so what? Well, this is the so what. How do you figure out how old you are in 1996, or rather, how old I am in 1996? Well, you don't have the 19 part, so forget that. What you do is you take the current year, 96, and you subtract 55, and you get back to the correct answer. Peter Diager is 41 years old. So far, so good. And next year, it's the same, 42, and 43, and 44. But when you get to 00, zero um, the computer does exactly what you tell it. And it takes 0, 0, and it subtracts 40, 55 from it, and it gives you back what? Well, the question marks there is because I don't know exactly what it does. In some systems, it would produce minus 55. Peter is minus 55 years old. In other systems, it would ignore the negative sign because that doesn't make any sense, and it would say Peter is 55 years old. Zero, zero, subtract 55, gives you minus 55, throw away the minus, Peter's 55. In either case, it's wrong. Very few systems back then would have given the correct answer here, and that is Peter's 45 years old. That's the problem. 
And that is the problem that affects every single inventory system. It affects every single banking system, every financial record that you have, every stock trade you have, anything that tries to validate how old is something. Should it be on its maintenance cycle? All of this is affected by this, plus many, many more things. Now the reality is, is that fixing this is, you know what? Single line of code, I can fix that. I'm a programmer. I've been at the job as a programmer for more than three days. There's nothing difficult here. I can fix this. But the problem is, is that there are billions of lines of code, many of which are written in languages which are difficult to read, Many of the programmers who wrote those systems have retired or died. Many of the systems, there is no source code. All you have is the object code, the assembled code, the compiled code. You don't have the source code. Many of the old systems are running inside emulators. You have no idea what systems are out there. There is no documentation. Get the idea? We have identified an issue, and everything, every single computer program might have this. Okay, so that, that's Y2K in a nutshell. But we're going to expand on that in the series. Who am I? Well, I wrote the first article that got wide exposure. Notice how I phrased that. I did not write the first article on Y2K. First off, when I wrote that article, it wasn't called Y2K. It was called Year 2000 Computer Problem, or the Date Rollover Problem, or the Field Overflow Problem. Very technical terms. There were articles going back, and I haven't been able to find them yet. They're in my files. I will have them for the podcast. I go back as early as 1971, I believe. And I'll be very, very straight in this podcast series. Is when, I, when I'm guessing, I'll, I'll let you know that. When I have an actual fact, I'll give you the citation. But I'll be very, very clear as to which is a dim memory and which is a fact that you can reference with the reference materials and links that I provide you. In 1993, I wrote Doomsday 2000, an article that basically just talked about the problem in the same way I did the slide previous. Here's the issue. We need to fix this. That was it. It was published in Computer World magazine. At the time, they had a circulation of about 360,000 people across the world, most of which in the States, because at the time, it was the States who had most of the computing systems in place. Uh, there's a generalization there. When I wrote that article, I was ridiculed by the entire industry. I, there were people who just laughed. There were people who wouldn't hire me to do any other work because I wrote this piece of nonsense. The article's still on the Internet. You can go out and Google Doomsday 2000. Chances are you'll find it. And at the end, I wrote another article, and it was related back. It was linked back deliberately, consciously, to the article that caused all the grief in the first place, Doomsday 2000. I wrote Doomsday Avoided. And for that one, in March 1999, I received death threats. I, re I was attacked left, right, and center. Major magazines, major newspapers, editorials, uh, the doomsday cultists were, were, were out after me with blood. Uh, <laughs> so I was ridiculed in the beginning, and I was threatened with death and mayhem at the end. This is why it's the Y2K autobiography. I've been at this a while. Now, one of the questions that I will cover, uh, we'll talk about the who am I. We we'll, won't have an entire session on this particular question, but the, my activities in Y2K will feature in it rather significantly. Why? Because I featured in it rather significantly. Okay, why did I get involved? I get asked this one a lot. And I've been thinking about it for a long, long time. What is it about my background, my upbringing, that, well, to be blunt, made me obsessive compulsive about this project? This is all I did. I eat, breathe, slept, Y2K. I didn't do anything else for about 10 years. 
and I, in looking back, a lot of pieces fell into place. Now, I'm not going to go through every one here, but I will have a session devoted to this in the series. Why? Because these are the reasons that motivated me to start on a project. They are also the reasons that might motivate us to take care of other issues that are facing us. I will delve into one little one. I used to work for IBM. This is the IBM Colt part on the right-hand side there. Colt was Canadian Online Tellers. And basically, it was the IBM system that was supporting the banking system across Canada. And one of the things it did was that if you were in a branch and you were dealing with a teller, the terminal the teller was using to access your bank account to see if you had money to deposit your check, to do that bank transfer, to do the automatic withdrawals for your aging mother who's in a retirement home, whatever it is you're doing, that ATM, that terminal was run, operated, driven, supported by Colt. Now, I was at the time working for IBM. This was my first job. This is back in 1978, 1979 time frame. I had just come out of high school. Uh, not high school. I had just come out of university. And I'm in this computer environment. And then they tell me something about how their operations work. They tell me that the system has to be up and running all the time. Otherwise, across Canada... The queue of people waiting to use the terminal that is no longer working because of what's happening in my department is getting longer and customers are getting antsy. There's nothing worse than banking if you can't get hold of your money. If you can't get your money out of your account, there's a problem and it's not an insignificant problem. So in this computer room at 245 Consumers Road in Toronto, North York, Willowdale, I think it was, they had a fake terminal on the wall. And the way it was working is that machine was being pulled. It was being pinged. It was being spoken to by the computer system as if it were a terminal. And basically it's doing is saying, are you there? Are you there? Do you have any work for me? Do you have any work for me? And as long as this terminal was getting that ping, was constantly being interrogated by the computer, everything would be fine. But this terminal on the wall wasn't really a terminal. It was literally a submarine klaxon, like an air raid warning system. I have no idea how many decibels it, it generated, but I do know this. The instant that the computer stopped polling this thing on the wall, this thing would yell. And basically, it would go off and let us all know we have a problem. And at that point, we were basically at battle stations. That computer's not working. That means there are people across Canada waiting in line for their money. That can't happen. So we would literally be at battle stations. There were rules. No one else other than computer operators on the floor. Everybody else off. I remember a situation where there was an IBM director on the floor, and I manhandled the person off the floor. Get off. But, but I'm the director. I don't care. Get off. We have work to do. And the work that we would do would be re-IPL the system. IPL. Initial program load, I think. Initial program loading, I can't even remember what it stands for. I know that what we were doing, we were firing up the computer, basically, turn it off and restart it, see if it'll recover. That was our first action. Now, understand, if we're sitting in the, the coffee room having a coffee and this, this air raid siren goes off, if we jump, there's coffee flying all over the place. So right at an early stage, IBM has trained me that having the computer working all the time is really, really important. And when it doesn't work, really, really bad things happen or could happen. Nothing else mattered. We had to get the computer up and running. Now, this is in my background. This is in my mind as I'm working at IBM. 
and I'm looking one day at the IPL system that we're going through, the process, and I notice that we type in 00. Now remember the time frame, 1978, 1979. We're typing in 00, or rather we would be. We're typing in two-digit years. We're typing in 78 or 79 to tell the computer what time it is because that's how, that's how it finds out. There's no Internet to hook to. We have to manually input it. And I asked myself a question. In the year 2000, when we type in 00, what happens to the computer? This is 1978. I go to my boss, and my boss says, are you worried? How old are you? And I, I do that math we did earlier. I'm 24 years old. And he says, you're worried about a problem that isn't going to happen for as long as you've been on the planet? We'll have taken care of that. Go away. And I did. Why? What do I know? I'm a computer operator. I'm nobody. My manager, well, managers are smart. They know everything. This is IBM. Who am I to say that we have a problem? So I go away. This is one of the things that drove me. There are others in that circle of things. Each one factors into how we think about computers in the world. There is one other I'll mention. Near the bottom of that ring, there's a guy by the name of Ted Nelson. Ted Nelson wrote a book in 1974 entitled Computer Lib and Computer Dreams. And in the book, there were two concepts. The first one, 1974, remember the time. We can and must understand computers now. This was the tagline for the book long before computers became as ubiquitous as they are today. And that stuck in my mind, that we have to understand how these things worked. And then there was another component to his philosophy and his thinking. Everything is intertwingled. Everything is interconnected. And computers were connecting them faster and faster every single day. Now, Let's back it up a little bit because there's another problem. I said first the technical problem, we all get that. The technical problem is easy. But the real Y2K problem was not the technical problem. This is rarely mentioned. Every time I was interviewed about Y2K, it was all about the technical problem, what we have to do, and what, ha what happens if we don't fix it. But that wasn't the problem I was working on. That wasn't the problem that I was concerned about because my problem was different. Back in 1993, when that first article came out, I happened to be up in camp, consultant's camp, run by Jerry Weinberg, who passed away a few years ago, where Jerry Weinberg was a luminary in the field, a consultant. And he brought up a whole bunch of computer consultants, people that he thought would have an impact, for whatever reason. And we're all up there, all bright people, by definition. And the article showed up at camp. It was that week. It was the first September first week of September of your year, and we were up in Mount Crested Butte. And I remember being surrounded by 30 other savvy computer people. And they laughed. And they said, this will be solved by then. Why are you worried about this? We'll take care of this in the normal course. And it was that attitude that this would take care of itself without anyone having to raise the alarm bells, that absolutely convinced me that the real problem we faced was not a technical problem. It was one of denial. There are problems in the world. They get bigger when we deny them, when we refuse to accept that they are a reality. They just grow bigger. And this was the problem I worked on for 10 years of my life. It was the denial issue. It was a change management project from start to finish. Now, before Y2K, we had lots of examples of computer problems. Computer problems that killed people. One of the things in Y2K was always asked is, what is the worst thing that can happen? And no one really wanted to answer that. I certainly didn't want to answer that because that's speculation. But I could point back and should have done it more. This is one of the areas where I made mistakes. We should have focused more on the examples we already had about computers causing more than a little bit of chaos when they don't act the way we expect them to act. Just one out of this, and then we'll continue moving along.
Ferac 25. Easily Google. You can Google this easily enough. Therac 25 was a radiation treatment device, medical device. Basically, you go underneath, it gives you a dose of radiation, usually to get rid of a cancer or something. It was one of the techniques that we use still to this day. And Therac 25 had a programming problem. Well, how bad can it be, Peter? Well, this is how bad. They stick you inside the machine, and the machine gives you 100, 200 times more radiation than you need, and you die of radiation poisoning. Computer problems cause all types of grief, and we have more than enough examples of how computers cause problems. Right now, as we speak, Boeing is dealing with their, what is it, the 727, 757? I can't remember the numbers. They had a computer problem. Two planes have crashed. How many people have died? Oh, the computer problem didn't bring down the plane. Well, 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 yeah, computer did something that was unexpected by the pilots. The pilots didn't know how to respond. They crashed and they died. Computers, the things that we depend upon, run the world. And when they don't run properly, there are consequences. Y2K was all about how do we avoid those consequences. It wasn't the end of the world is going to happen. We're predicting the end of the world. It was we have a problem. We need to fix it. Otherwise, we're going to have more problems. And they'll be very visible. And they'll be big. And they'll be costly. So before Y2K, it'll be worthwhile walking through a whole slew of these things, trying to identify where do the problems occur and why do they escape our testing processes? <laughs> When we were solving Y2K, as we always do when we try to fix something here, something breaks over there. That's inevitable. There are all types of examples. London Electricity is one of the more interesting ones. Uh, they were modifying one of their accounting systems. Their, who knows what it is? And they made a mistake. And basically, there were tens of thousands of people without power until they fixed the problem. Why were they doing this? Well, to fix a Y2K problem. So as we were fixing things, we were unintentionally breaking things. Now, that didn't happen a tremendous amount, but it happened. And we'll spend some time talking about that. And it's unavoidable, of course, that we have to spend time on this stuff. Now, understand, I, like I said, I got two dozen large boxes. I have all types of hype out there. Uh, some of them are hilarious. Some of them are almost deliberate. And keeping my earlier promise in mind, these folks are all heroes in their own story. There were people who believed that all the banks were going to fail. And we could argue that they were only doing it to sell their books and everything else, but then that same argument would be turned back to me. I was only saying this to get speaking engagements and do consulting and, and all the rest. Uh, books like Y2K is already too late. Um, okay, <laughs> that's your take. It wasn't my take. But if you're not really a computer specialist and you don't really know how much progress we've made in the solution of the problem, maybe that's the right book to publish. And then there was this particular magazine, which ran for, I don't know, maybe a year or two, and every issue was exactly the same. Bombs, explosions, fires. And this is part of the story, too. But unlike most media coverage, this is not the whole story. This is the noise during the project that we had to deal with. And it was exacerbated by the media itself. We'll get, I'll give you an example of that in a, in a few minutes. But there's, we can't talk about Y2K without talking about it's the end of the world and how the media addressed this and how some of the... I don't know, people who were selling survival food ad address this. There were some organizations that did a tremendous amount of good work. One of the most influential groups was the British Computer Society. And they published a ton of really, really good stuff. Now, they weren't in it at first, but once they got the message, and I believe it was just before Tony Blair uh, opened up a conference. I was the keynoter. Tony Blair opened up for me. And Tony Blair was finally telling the stories that we'd been telling for a number of years. 
But the British Computer Society was one of the unsung heroes in all of this. One of the things we will do is we're going to talk, focus on, okay, what does a Y2, Y2K project look like? How did you start? What did you have to do? What were the concerns you had? And start at the very beginning of any Y2K project, and you have to have a policy statement. What is it that you believe that you're doing? What is the key ideas that you need to keep in mind? What are the priorities? Oh, we spoke about triage. One of the things we'll discuss in that whole series is where do all these words come from? Because they were all part of the communication strategy. Systemic triage was another way to communicate a particular aspect of the Y2K program at a particular aspect in time at a, to a particular audience. Uh, the story changed. And that's a part of the story, too. How did the Y2K story evolve from 1993 until, well, the year 2000? The, the retrospective that came out. Okay, but You don't just need a policy. Here's part of the stuff. And yeah, there's humor. The very last part of that uh, whole list of stuff is pray. Hope that you get it right. Hope that we did what we needed to do. So we will spend some time on typical Y2K projects, the influence of project management. Um, an example would be, how did Y2K influence the growth of IT in India? I believe, and this is going to be, would be difficult to prove, but I think there's enough evidence out there to suggest it has some merit that Y2K was the thing that started the IT industry in India because of all the outsourcing that went on. Outsourcing uh, was basically we sent code down to India, the, and then you had software farms where people actually eyeballing code, running them through various types of applications to figure out where the dates were, making the changes, verifying that the changes worked, and then sending it back. Now, that's relatively low-skilled in the IT industry uh, labor, and it started the IT industry. Supporting that would be more difficult. Someone needs to write a thesis on that. They can get their PhD on that one alone. But we're going to go through an entire Y2K project. And out of that will be stuff that we've learned and how, how it has affected project management today. PMBOK, PMI, PRINCE, all that stuff. What have been the implications? What are the consequences? The positive fallout. And then we get to one of the most favorite topics of mine, the media. The media was a huge component of this without any shadow of a doubt. And if it hadn't been for the media, we would not have succeeded. So I'll give them that. However, there were times where we were fighting an uphill battle to communicate what we needed to communicate and not what the media wanted to communicate. Now I'll give you an example. I received a phone call in early October 1999. I received a phone call from the Toronto Star. Toronto Star is one of the major newspapers in Canada. Mr. Diager, could we come out to your home and photograph you in front of all your survival gear for Y2K? And my response was, well, look, you're, you're more than welcome to come out. I'm not going to stop saying, you know, start saying no to the media now. You're more than welcome to come out. However, when you come out, there is no pile of stuff to photo. I will open up my cupboards, and you can see that we have a fully stocked cupboard. Why? Why do we have fully stocked cupboards? Well, I live in Canada, and in Canada, we have, in Toronto, we have things called ice storms and blizzards and snow, just typical Canadian. And any Canadian worth their salt has at least a week, hopefully two, worth of food in the house, so that if you get stuck in your house for a week, you don't starve to death and have to start eating, you know, Fido. So you're welcome to come out, but there's nothing to photograph. I don't believe you need to do anything more than what a normal Canadian does in preparation for winter. And they said, oh, okay, we won't come out then. Fair enough. Hung up the phone. A couple of days later, there's an article in the Toronto Star. When exactly, Peter? October the 13th, 1999. So you can go out and do the research and find it yourself. Here's an article. 
This is the Toronto Star. Now, at the time, this is October, early in March of that year, I'd written an article that said, Doomsday Avoided. We've taken care of it. And for the rest of the year, I've been saying everything is fine. There is no reason to do anything. We've done our job. Everything will be good. All clear. Sound the all clear sign. We're all good. That's my message. <laughs> Bottling and preserving is a good idea for Y2K. Now, you see the image? The image is fascinating. Here's that crazy guy in front of all these survival good. And if you read the caption, be prepared. Peter Diager, whose Toronto company offers advice to people about preparing for Y2K, is set for any food shortages. Well, a couple of things wrong with that. First off, the most important one is I do not advise companies to do any of this. So that's just factually incorrect. Now, you could say, well, Peter, you've been advising people how to prepare for Y2K in the sense of fixing the problems. So it's a matter of opinion as to whether you're prepared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I get it. So there's an opinion there. There's some ambiguity there. However, that's really interesting because it's not me in the, fit, in the picture. Um, I don't look like that. I've never looked like that. That ain't me. So here's the question. How did that happen? Now, we're all heroes in our own story. Somehow this happened. Two days later, they printed a retraction because I phoned them up and said, hey, um, excuse me, that's, that's not me in the photo. And they printed a retraction. The Toronto Star regrets to announce that, you know, the caption was mislabeled. It was not Peter Diager in the image. The message there that is very, very well communicated to everybody is Peter Diager, the expert who's saying that everything is fine, is actually secretly hoarding food. That isn't the message we were communicating. Now, understand, I have hundreds of media stories, and we are going to have a discussion about media uh, on this. This will be at least an hour as long. And it won't all be slamming the media. The media was vital. But it will be a discussion about how the message had to change and how when you were communicating through the media, you really have to insulate your message in such a way that what you're trying to say is actually getting communicated. And the onus is on us when working with the media to make sure that our message is getting through. For a number of years, especially in 1999, a journalist would ask me the following set of questions. Now, what was amazing to me is that, like I said, I've been interviewed by dozens and dozens, thousands of journalists. But this particular sequence of questions came up more than a dozen times. I was beginning to suspect that they were using a script to communicate this. It went as follows. Mr. Diaga, do you believe it is safe to fly on December 31st, 1999? And the answer was yes, absolutely. We did some, we did the work. We found a couple of issues. They've been addressed. At no point were planes going to fall out of the sky. It is safe to fly. Oh, Mr. Diaga, where will you be December 31st, 1999? Now, my hope was is that they twig to the human interest side of my answer. It was true, but it was crafted to be true. As in, I was going to be somewhere, but it was I was going to be there so that I could make that statement, if you get where I'm going with this. My response would be, I intend to be at Gus O'Connor's pub in Doolin, Ireland, quaffing pints after a decade of really intensive work. Oh. Mr. Diager, let me get the quote correct. Despite the fact that you claim that planes are safe to fly, you will be nowhere near a plane that night. Is that correct? <laughs> In other words, they have their agenda. They have their narrative. And by the way, again, that's why we're doing this webinar series is that I am taking back the narrative. The narrative was is that we were keeping secrets. The narrative was it was all going to go to hell in a handbasket, but we weren't telling everybody that. In reality, we were trying to communicate what was going on to the best of our ability. I then modified my plans for New Year's Eve. 
And I contacted United Airlines and said, look, uh, there's all this concern about being safe to fly. I'd like to do the following. I'd like to come down to Chicago the afternoon of the 31st, and I want to get on your plane that leaves at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, can't remember what it was. And I want to fly to Heathrow, and then you'll fly me back on the next available flight. And they said, fine. So they stuck me in business uh, business class. I didn't pay for the flight. And I was on a plane, and at the stroke of midnight, I was at 33,000 feet over Newfoundland somewhere heading towards Heathrow. Absolutely no concerns at all. The problem is when I told people that, when the reporters asked me, where are you going to be? I'm going to be flying in a plane. For the most part, that was not covered. It was, but for the most part, it wasn't. Because you see, that one doesn't have the excitement to it. That story says everything's going to be fine. And they would rather have given you the other story that it wasn't. So again, for the record, that ain't me in that photo. But it says it's me in that photo. That ain't me in front of food. But it said it's me in front of my horde. The media. So much fun. We're going to talk about the entire communications timeline and how it changed over time. Now, note the asterisk there and the little note in the bottom. that This is just a placeholder. Don't hold me to those because I still have to sift through all the material to figure out where exactly these things happened and at what point different phrases like iron triangle, systemic triage came into play and what our intent was when we brought those terms into the discussion. Okay. There is humor. Here's a bit of humor. <laughs> Back in the day when we were starting this out, this is 1993, 1994 time frame. I have to zero in on that a little bit better. That was probably 1994. We were running a mail list server. And at the time, we had 20,000 people on that mail list. Now, I don't know, if you weren't around in the day, you won't really know how these things work. Basically, it's a little server device, a server program, and if you send an email to it, then it goes out to everybody. So you send in one email, and it goes out to 20,000 people. Okay. So anytime you want to communicate with 20,000 people, ask a question, you send it out, and it goes out to 20,000 people. So far, so good. Someone, and these things weren't well designed, uh, to say the least, and you had to really understand how they worked. Someone went out of the office, so they put up a I am out of the office automatic response. You can see where this is going. So you send that person, and the, the listserv sends them an email. They send back a note automatically, I'm out of the office, back in a week. And that message comes back. And it goes into the server, and it sends out 20,000 that I'm out of the office. And then it hits that person again, and it boop, boop, boop. It's like a nuclear reaction. I was out of town when this happened. Uh, it wasn't funny at the time, because everybody's mailbox, all 20,000 people on the mailbox, had tens of thousands of emails flooding them. It was an early denial-of-service uh, attack on every single person involved in Y2K. I know some of you are saying um, the irony is just a little bit too much. Well, it was. I published a book on the bug stops here. We had a bunch of uh, humor contests towards the end of 1999, and the goal was to inject some humor uh, to basically celebrate the fact that we were actually making large inroads on the problem. Uh, Mad Magazine got involved in it. Uh, there were all types of humor books out there. And one of the things I'll be adding into the entire podcast series is I will be putting together a book as an extra value added component because this thing will be Patreon supported as we move ahead. Uh, this is going to take an incredible amount of time. My estimate, a rough estimate, is I'm looking at a thousand hours of effort to put this series together. Now, I'm doing it for my own personal reasons, but it's also going to take away from a whole bunch of other stuff. So my hope is that I'll get enough Patreon supporters to actually pay a little bit of that time back. Okay. What happened on the day? 
I mean, the story is nothing happened. Well, that ain't true. Um, a tremendous amount happened. One of the things that happened that was curious is, and I, I re already received a couple of emails on this and said, Peter, we were waiting at the stroke of midnight and absolutely nothing happened and we felt disappointed. There was definitely one of these, you know, the, the, the weather people when a large hurricane or com something coming in, I mean, they're, they're classifying the hurricane as, you know, this will be a class five or whatever, a category five hurricane. And they're, the, they're chatting it up and they're talking about it and they're trying to get you to leave the, the way they should because these things are dangerous. People die in hurricanes. And then it, it dies and it becomes a category two when it's landfall. And you can actually hear the disappointment in the, the announcers' voices when they're talking about oh, this drop down to category two. It's not a celebration, but it's actually a disappointment because there's much more good media shots you can take if it's category five. A little bit cynical, perhaps. Except we had the same problem with Y2K. There were people who were disappointed, a lot of people, and a lot of people angry that they made all these preparations for no reason. True, true, they have 15 years worth of toilet paper in the basement, but you know what? Maybe they shouldn't have had to do that. And of course, we got blamed, we being the people who spoke about this. So what happened? Well, there were a couple of things. How about Pentagon losing access to their satellites for a couple of days? Yeah, the, the, the missile defense system satellites, the ones that tell you whether or not someone is firing missiles at the United States of America. That was down for a few days. So nothing much happened. Don't worry about it. We had other problems. We had nuclear power plant problems around the world. Nothing major, but we had some. We had billing systems that went awry. We had, uh, there was an NHS report. Uh, worthwhile Googling. It came out on September the 10th, 2001. Next day, there was an event that sort of pushed everything else off the newspapers. But here's what you could Google if you're interested. Downs syndrome, Pathlan, P-A-T-H-L-A-N, NHS for National Health Services, Y2K. Google that. There were Y2K problems. If anybody ever tells you that there were no Y2K problems, they have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. I was a clearinghouse for many of them, under non-disclosure for many of them. I can't talk about a lot of the stuff that happened. Uh, how convenient, someone says. Yeah, but there's a lot of stuff I can talk about and will talk about. There are a tremendous number of problems. Now, keep in mind one other factor. Why aren't these things publicized? Well, consider yourself to be a bank. And on January the 1st, you have some problems with your banking system. Is your first inclination to pick up the phone and phone up the New York Times and say, we have a banking problem, it's Y2K related at the First National Bank or some other bank, it doesn't matter which one it is, are you going to do that? No, of course not. Why? Because the moment you do that, you cause a run on your bank. Banks rest, survive, are maintained by nothing but trust. The trust that we have in our financial institutions that will they protect our money. The moment we think that they can't protect our money, we want our money back. The moment everybody does that, even for the healthiest of banks, the bank fails. If you really want an encapsulation of that, just watch the movie It's a Wonderful Life. That explains the financial system and the reliance on trust better than anything I could ever do. Okay. Lessons learned. Well, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, simple ones, we're always short-sighted. We don't really think out to the future the way we should. It's always bigger. It can't just be one person. <laughs> uh, the last ones, again, a little bit of cynicism, but borne out by my own personal experiences. Uh, no, good, no good deed goes unpunished. I've been crucified uh, because of my work on Y2K. I know dozens of people who have been told to take Y2K off their resume because it is not something you want to let people know about. There was a fellow, I contacted him in preparation for this series, and he was rather prominent in Y2K. He's now working in another organization, and I'm filing off all the serial numbers because I would not divulge who he is without his permission. 
And I asked him if he'd like to be a part of one of the interviews to give his perspective on what they went through in their organization to solve this. And he says, I have to get back to you. I need to go speak to my board to find out if they're okay with that. Automatically, he's indicating that there is some issue about Y2K, that speaking about what we did is, it doesn't advance your career because the perception is it was a hoax, that it was a fraud, that it was overhyped. The reality is it's different. And he came back and he said, Peter, I can't. Our board doesn't want to touch this with a 10-foot pole. We do not want to be associated with it at all. Now, here's someone who did good work, but they can't talk about it. This is the narrative that I want to take back. We did good work. Yes. Was it hyped? Yeah, it was. Uh, who did the hyping? Us, the IT folks, the techies, or the media in general, or the people selling survival goods, or the religious right, who were deep into this at the end. Uh, th there is a lot to discuss and a lot to learn. I've been asked, Peter, did we spend more money than we needed to? And my response is, with respect, a giggle. Of course we did. You identify any single project more than $5 million and ask me if we, spend it, if we spent more than we needed to on that project. The answer is yes. We built a highway. We spent more money. It took longer. We built a bridge. It took more money. Did we have to spend? No. But it is what it is. Large projects... And by the way, this is one of the largest projects we've ever embarked upon. This is, was, a $300 billion project. People don't spend that type of money because Peter Diager, or anyone else for that matter, says we have a problem. People spend that type of money because they go and look at their system, hoping to prove me wrong, and push in zero zero, hit the enter key, and then go, uh-oh. That was unexpected. And now they embark on their project. We spent $300 billion on this project. And we fixed it. We didn't fix all of it. And it was touch and go for a long time. But by March 1999, I felt more than comfortable writing the article Doomsday Avoided. Because we did. We have all types of problems. I get asked all the time, Peter, how do we deal with the next problem coming down the line. Well, take your pick. Climate change. I will not brook any arguments that this is not an issue. It's an issue. Anybody who hasn't gotten that message right now has got their head firmly planted in the sand. And I don't care about ideologies. It's a, The information is available to all of us. We can see it. Um, whether we're causing it or not, you can argue that if you want. I don't care. But the reality is this has to be fixed. Sustainability. Plastics. Our oceans are getting filled up with plastic. Fish that wash up on the shore, they're doing autopsies. They're opening them up. They're dying because of plastic ingestion. In the ocean, that means there's enough plastic in the ocean to kill fish. Well, when those fish die, they get eaten by other fish. Plastic is forever. This is an issue. Are we too late on this one? You know what? Possibly. If we're already killing fish with the amount of plastic currently in the ocean, given that we're not reducing the amount of plastic we're putting into the ocean, in fact, it increases daily, then how do we get that plastic out of the ocean? I don't have an answer to that. CRISPR. CRISPR is the ability to um, hack your own DNA. Wonderful. Great. Uh, tremendous uses. <laughs> My God, the stuff we're going to do with that is just astounding. Uh, could it be put to evil use? Um, accidental use? CRISPR is coding. Basically, you're, you're coding DNA. And anybody who's been in software knows that we make coding errors. We make coding errors. This is not something to be taken lightly. Wealth inequity. Most of the money in the world is in a handful of pockets. The rest of us are overstressed. Work-life balance. Most young people come out of university, come out of college. They get part-time work. No benefits. Less than 30 hours a week, so we don't have to pay them benefits. This is an issue. 2032, we have another rollover problem happening. Unix. Infrastructure costs. All over the world, we're building things. We don't put money aside to fix them. Bridges are falling down. One fell down in Italy. It fell down because we didn't have the money to 
keep it up to date. Fell down. People died. All across Canada, all across the States, all across the world. We build things and we don't allow for the money that's going to maintain them. Apathy. Who cares? I'm not getting involved in any of this. I've done one. Oh, by the way, one of the other reasons for me to do this, 2100's coming. And we're back to using two-digit years. And we're going to be back to a Y2K problem, type problem, very shortly. Peter, what do you mean shortly? It's 80 years ago. Why aren't you worried? Why are you worried about this? They'll have fixed it by then. I've heard this all before, folks. 2100 is coming. Oh, and there's an added complexity. And this one, this one is going to be real. There's an added complexity here. Every year we have leap year problems. Question, is 2100 a leap year? Most programmers are going to get it wrong. You see, most programmers know one rule. If it is divisible, evenly divisible by four, it's a leap year. Okay. Except if it's also evenly divisible by 100, then it's not a leap year. And you're looking at 2100 and you say, oh, that's not a leap year. Um, well, unless it's also divisible by 400, then it's back to being a leap year again, which means that 2100 is not a leap year. But most programmers have written code to indicate that it is. Peter, what can happen if a leap year calculation is incorrect? Well, you know that financial system? If you put anything into a bank on the end of you know, February the 29th, but your computer doesn't recognize it as February the 29th, what happens? Bottom line, I don't know. Would you all want to find out? Not really. And I want to make sure that we have a historical record so that when we get closer, the person who starts talking about this isn't hit back with, we've been through Y2K. It was never an issue. It was a hoax. They should have at least one historical record that says, no, 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 it was a problem. We fixed it at great expense, and we need to fix it again. So there'll be 10 to 12 installments of this. I haven't figured out all the details yet. Uh, it's scheduled to start on January the 1st, 2020. It's already There's already a placeholder up on iTunes, and this particular webinar will be on iTunes as an audio. So if you look on iTunes, look in the podcast area, and look for Y2K, an autobiography, you should be able to find it. Every week, except for the, the beginning of each month, I'll have the interviews. If you were a part of a Y2K project and you'd like to be a part of this project, in other words, if you'd like to be interviewed as a project manager who was involved in Y2K, by all means, contact me. I'll give you the details. The idea, the basic idea is I'll have a bunch of questions that you'll know in advance, but I also want a couple of questions from you that you want to be asked. It'll take no more than 20 or 30 minutes, so we can do it by Skype or something. And I want to insert those, basically voices from the trenches. We are going to support, I am going to support this via Patreon. That those details that need to be set up. I'll be working on that in the next while. Uh, it's going to be hosted through Podbean. And like I said, it's already up on iTunes. Y2K, an autobiography. A look back at the world's largest global effort on a single project. And we spent a lot of money to fix it. I don't ever want to be involved in it again. And if you have any comments, feedback, that's my email address. pdauger at technability. Dot com. We have a couple of minutes for some information. That is the last screen. For those of you who usually get PDUs from this webinar series, there is no PDU this month. This is pure content. Uh, there's no extra reward. It is simply a look back on Y2K. Uh, I will take a quick look at questions. Uh, potential issue in 2032, there is another date that rolls over in 2032. I don't have all the information. Uh, I don't want to speak off the cuff on this one. In the uh, podcast series, we'll get into it in some more detail. Uh, good. Uh, anyone who wants to be a part of this in the interviews, please send me an email. That is the way to contact me on this. Uh, too, too, too little late. Do we start yet? <laughs> I uh, ran my first Y2K project in 1984 for a trust company due to products with 15-year terms. Yes, Scottish Widows Bank, uh, back in the, I believe it was 1980s, late 1980s, was running into mortgage problems.
problems because their mortgages were looking out 25 years, something like that, or 20 years, 20 year mortgages. So they were running into problems then. We had precursors to Y2K long before Y2K. Folks, we have run out of time. Certainly, I want your feedback on this one. I want your emails on this one. And I look forward to you joining up and supporting this podcast series scheduled to start January the 1st, 2020. 2020 look back, 2020 hindsight. Take care, guys. Be good. Peter Diager signing out.